So it's not really enough to know how to implement and derive a comma filter. In order to be able to use it in real problems, it's also important to be able to analyze its behavior to make sure that, for one thing, the implementation is correct, but perhaps most importantly, how to make sure that the choices that we made are appropriate and the parameters of those models are chosen such that we cram out the best performance of our filter. So this is the tricky part. With the exception of this course, we tend not to know the models of the system beforehand. So we need to design these ourselves. And unfortunately, the only thing that we can know is that our design will be wrong. It will be wrong in the sense that they are just mathematical models and they will never match reality to 100%. And that is okay. However, this means that we need to be able to examine the output of the filter to draw conclusions regarding if we have made appropriate design choices. So in this lecture, we're going to look at some tips and tricks as well as some more formal methods for how we can do this. We will do this both when we have access to ground truth data, for example, if we're doing simulations, and when we do not know the true state sequence. We have divided this lecture into three parts. In the first part, we'll give an introduction and look at the fundamental properties of the comma filter. In the second part, we'll look closer at the properties of the innovation and how we can use these to assess the performance of our filter. In the last part, we will look at how to tune our filter by adjusting the motion and measurement model. Before we start, I would like to go through some mathematical results of how one can decompose joint expectations uh, over multiple variables. And this is something that is related to the product rule of probability densities. If you're not familiar with this, I hope that this will help you understand the results uh, that we'll present throughout this lecture. So the result goes like this. For any two random variables, x and y, it holds that if you take the expectation over a fairly well-behaving function, g of x and y, over both of these random variables, we can then decompose this into two expectations. One where we fix y, for example, this means that we condition on y and the expectation and take the expected value only over x. As we marginalize out x in this expression here, this here will only be a function of y. Let's call it h of y. So we can then write this as taking only the expectation over h of y, which is then this function here. There are many ways to think about what's happening here. Either we can view it from the aspect of sample averaging as we can approximate the expected value by drawing independent samples of x and y, and then calculate the average value of g of x and y uh, from these samples. So in the first case here, we can view this as drawing samples from x and y jointly. So if we draw this in this figure, it will mean that we draw samples both from x and y, like this. we will get something like this, and then we can calculate uh, the average uh, of these samples evaluated in the function g of x and y. In this case, however, we instead first draw samples for a fixed value of y, then can draw samples of x. So we fix y, let's say y1, and then we draw samples on x for this y. And maybe it becomes something like this. And then we draw a new sample of y, let's call it y2. And then we draw new samples of x for this value. And then we continue doing so for many different values of y. And we get something like this. And we can see that these two are equivalent ways of drawing samples from x and y. We can use both of these samples to approximate the expected value of g of x and y. We can also view this strictly mathematically, where this expected value here is the integral where we can decompose this using the product rule. Um, so we decompose this into p of x given y 
times p of y. And if we separate out factors depending on x and on y, we can rewrite the integral as where this here clearly is h of y. So this integral here is simply, which is the expected value of h of y. So please keep this in mind as we go through the results of this lecture. So now that we know this mathematical result, let's tackle the main objective of this lecture. From previous lectures, we know how to implement a Kalman filter. First, we calculate the predicted mean and covariance by solving these equations. And then we use these together with the current observation in order to calculate the posterior mean and covariance uh, like this. Now this sounds simple enough, right? However, before we can solve these equations, there are some design parameters that we need to choose. First of all, we need to select a state representation. That is, which states should we use to represent what we're interested in? This could, for example, be position and velocity in 2D. So let's say that we represent our state, xk, as position, x1, x2, and velocity in these dimensions x1 and x2. That's one example. Related to this, we need to define the transition matrix, ak minus 1, for this state representation, and also choose the amount and properties of the process noise covariance, qk minus 1. Lastly, we also need to derive our measurement model matrix, hk, and choose the measurement noise covariance, rk. So given that we somehow made all these choices, how do we know that the filter performs well? First of all, have we implemented the filter correctly? Or are there errors in our code? Secondly, have we selected appropriate models and state representations for our problem? There are usually several different ways to represent what we're interested in. For example, if we want to track a vehicle in front of us, do we just describe the position of the vehicle? Or do we also include the velocity and acceleration vectors? What we choose will affect the type of motion model that we can have. And the goal should perhaps be that we should have as accurate models as possible while keeping the complexity to a reasonable level. And we will discuss these trade-offs more in the coming lecture. And lastly, but perhaps more imp most importantly, are the covariance matrices uh, properly tuned? And that is, is the amount of process noise and measurement noise just right for the problem? In this lecture, we'll give some tools for how to answer these questions. To be able to answer these questions, I think it's good to know how we expect the filter to behave in an ideal case. That is, when everything is working as it should, and we have selected and tuned our models to the system. Although this assumes that the models that we have chosen actually models the underlying system, which we know it does not, um, still it's often reasonable to come very close to the ideal performance, especially in this course where the true models are given. So we know in the ideal case that the Kalman filter calculates the true posterior by calculating the posterior mean and covariance of this, nor, uh, of this Gaussian density. And there are two interesting properties that well-performing filters should have as a result of this. First, the estimation error uh, should be zero mean. That is, the expected value of the true state minus our estimate of the state should be zero. We should note that the expectation here is taking both over the state xk and the data y1 to k. And that the estimate x hat k given k is deterministic condition on the data. So this means that on average, the estimates from the comma filter should be unbiased. And you can prove that this holds true yourself by using the result that we presented in the beginning of the lecture. And using the fact that we can decompose this joint expected value here as where in the inner expected value here, we condition on the data. One way to check that your implementation has this property is, for example, by making several simulations where we can generate state and measurement sequence from our model and then take the sample average of the estimation error for each time instance k. This method of numerically evaluating the expected value is called Monte Carlo simulations. So this is how we can check that our estimate is unbiased. 
For the posterior covariance computed by the comma filter, we know by definition that this is the conditional estimation error covariance, like this. And as we discussed in the previous lecture, according to comma filter equations, this is independent of the observations y1 to k. So this is, as such, conditioning on the observations here should not make a difference, and the estimation error covariance that we get from the filter should be the same as the mean squared error, where we also average over the data. Again, we can check this by making Monte Carlo simulations in order to calculate this expected value numerically. We should also note that the MSE here is a matrix as we're taking the outer product of the estimation error in comparison to the more common form where we use the inner product to calculate the MSE. So, although it's fairly easy to check these conditions, they both have a one major drawback, and that is that we need to know the true state xk in order to calculate these. Obviously, in most real situations, we don't know the true state, and if we did, it would be no reason for us to try to estimate it in the first place, right? However, there are some important situations where we actually know the true state, and that is if we are doing simulations, where we can generate both the state trajectory and the related observations, or if we have access to some more accurate reference sensor that can measure the state sufficiently accurate such that we can use it as a proxy for the true state. For example, it's common that you can equip your vehicle with reference positioning systems, which are fusing information from a global navigation satellite system, like GPS, with a highly accurate inertial navigation system to give centimeter accuracy of the position of the vehicle on controlled situations. And with that type of accuracy, we can use these measurements as the ground truth for our state in this case. In the common parts of this lecture, we will look at alternatives where we don't have access to the true state.